Uh, I want to walk through what the future of Solana looks like and why we're excited about sort of building what we call internet capital markets. And it's relevant to everybody in this room, if you're working in crypto or TradFi, that it intersects some way in the things you do every day. And it allows us to articulate better what we do as an industry. All right, with that, let's get into it. You know, today's capital markets don't work for everyone, right? You've seen some version of this. If you haven't, you know, we're in finance-ish, uh, finance adjacent, but the everyday person understands that there's something about their life that doesn't uh, fit right in because they're not able to sort of realize the American dream in the way that, or the regional version of that, in the way that you used to, or the boomers used to. You know, get a job, you can get married, and there's like opportunities for family formation. And so uh, it shows up in different ways, right? Like you know, when Larry Fink talks, talks to investors, it shows up as people being anxious about the global economy. When you survey the everyday person, they feel like they have, uh, ac you know, fewer people ha feel like they have access to the uh, American dream than even 10 or 15 years ago. And the reason for this is the over-financialization of our society, and we'll get to that in a second. But it's really, uh, um, it's really because your freedom is hyperinflating. You know, this is a graph from a guy called Infra uh, on, on X, but it gives you a sense for how your freedom has quantitatively inflated. Why do we invest? We invest because we're trying to buy back our future time, right? You're, you're saving into an asset class today, so in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you can retire and do whatever you want. You know, in 1971, if you wanted to buy one unit of the S&P 500, you, it used to cost you 25 hours of your of average wages. Today, it costs you 195 hours of the uh, to buy one unit of the S&P 500. That's how much more expensive your freedom is, right? And then, if you look at the difference between labor and capital, you see this massive difference, and we've all experienced this, especially after the GFC, right? Which is kind of why you feel like the you know the the standard path is not available to people anymore, unless you're an asset owner. Uh, you know, that's the average hourly wage is a percentage. Uh, changed since 1971, and then you have capital, which is average hourly, uh, which has basically grown 8x faster than the average hourly wage, right? So if you owned capital, you did very well, and if you didn't, you kind of like got left behind. And you know, this is uh, average hourly wage as a percentage of GDP, and the, the, which has gone down. So as GDP has increased, average hourly wage as a percentage of that has gone down whereas the average net worth of the top 1% has gone up as GDP has increased. So gains are privatized, losses are socialized. You should definitely follow this account, it's interesting. But this sets up the stage for where uh, this is going. And you know, look, this is not intentional, it's an accidental outcome of the you know, de national debt that the US has, where they need to keep interest rates artificially low to be able to refinance their debt, and that creates an accidental price bubble, uh, asset price bubble, and to add to that, you have AI, right? You sort of like have this world where 80% of 80% of jobs can be automated in the near future, which means the, those average wages you saw will be further deflated because there's gonna be fewer people required in the workforce. So you sort of end up in this world where you have a fork in the road. You, ha you can either go the route of UBI, which is like the welfare economy, universal basic income, where you airdrop some money to everybody's bank account once a month, and then they go buy their groceries and you know, pay for their bills through that. Um, but you know, you're sort of attached to the state in that world, and, and uh, I think there's a much more inspired future, which is universal basic ownership, which is the alternative, which is anybody with a mobile phone should be able to own assets so you can join the capital class. And then you can close the gap between labor and capital. Um, one example of this in the non-crypto world is the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation, that you know, it's a state-owned corporation that takes all the profits from the you know the natural gas and mining, uh, and, and oil industry, and then airdrops it to every resident of Alaska, and they airdrop just the profit. So it's not like a UBI-style thing. It's you have a stake in the enterprise of uh, the Alaskan state. They got seventeen hundred dollars last year in an airdrop. Much more interesting. That's kind of like closer to the stakeholder capitalism, where everybody can be an owner by default, versus you know having to become an owner. All right, so internet capital markets, where does Solana fit in? We see a world where we want to reduce the barriers to asset ownership and reduce the barriers to asset uh, issuance. Asset ownership, let's talk about that. Like, you know, most private markets are private, right? Uh, a lot of those gains have been privatized because 
these companies don't want to go public. The private markets are deep enough that they can raise money from wealthy accredited investors. And so the everyday retail investor doesn't have access to Databricks, SpaceX. These are companies that have been private for so long that they choose to be private because you can buy one share of Tesla and sue Elon for his compensation. It's kind of like a headache to be a public company. So fewer companies want to be public. In fact, you have 50% fewer public companies today than you did 30 years ago which is insane, right? So uh, a lot of the gains have been privatized. So we need to bring those back into the public markets in some way. And you know, we think Solana is going to play a material role in this. Um, and then, of course, the number of tech companies going public has also reduced, partially because the 2021 benchmark set an ir irrational valuation standard for a lot of the startups, and they don't want to take a down round, but partially because they want to remain private. All right. But the public markets are saturated. Like this is like every valuation metric known to man, and it's it's. I think we can all agree that they're uh, that they're sort of overvalued in the in the traditional sense of it uh, by every one of those metrics. Now that is not a prediction of like when the bubble will pop or like what the prices are. But you're forcing retail to buy because they're saving to buy these assets at historically high valuations. And by the way, because of the way passive investing works. You're supposed to invest in the S&P 500. How many of you do that, right? Through some passive vehicle? Okay, we have some responsible investors. The others are all degenerate, just all port, full port co in, in whatever uh, you're doing in the Solana trenches. But the, the, you're not as diversified as you think you are because there were, you know, for, every, for every dollar that gets invested in the S&P 500 index fund, you know, 30 cents of those dollars go into the mag seven because of the way the fund is set up, which is market cap weighted. So you're actually way more concentrated in those seven stocks than, like the, than you think. So, uh, uh, so where does this take us, right? This takes us to a world where it's not all public markets, though. Even though the number of private com public companies are decreasing in the traditional financial markets, the number of tokens being launched is going up into the right on internet capital markets. Now, of course, a lot of these are meme coins, a lot of these are governance tokens, there are a, lot, a lot of these are valueless. But what it is simulating is an environment where you can issue assets and have investors participate in it, and you can very easily, with a few strokes of a pen, change the regulations to allow anybody to issue productive assets on the internet natively, allowing for a new regime of uh, capital markets. Um, by the way, you know, like a lot of these companies want to give stock out. They want to, you know, Airbnb wanted to give their hosts some equity when they went public. Uber wanted to, um, you know, give drivers equity, but they couldn't do it because of this cumbersome securities law. But guess what? If you manage the cap table, you know how hard it is to add an extra row into that cap table. It's a pain to manage more shareholders. But a coin table, you can scale that infinitely. You can have a million coin holders, and it doesn't matter, right? It's trivial. So crypto simplifies compliance. You know, like we, if you wanted US dollars outside the US, you had to fill all these lengthy forms, get an offshore bank account, hope that you would be like, accepted into the, into, the, into the bank, and then you'd get a, a US dollar bank account, or you'd get cash. Today, you download a mobile app that has a picture of a ghost, and you get US dollar stablecoin in your, in your wallet, no KYC, right? It completely metabolizes all the compliance and procedural overhead uh, into just a mobile application. This is where every asset is going to go as it comes on to Solana, where you'll be able to get access to the price action of any asset that you want on a mobile phone with an internet connection. Right? So, and better, by the way, this is not new. It's the old is new again, where better assets have always been a thing you know, in the, uh, when securities were early in their, in their beginning, in, in their development, when you should have certi certificates like this, where whoever owned the certificates or possessed the certificates was the owner of the, sh of, the, uh, of the equities. Now, of course, they got rid of this because you know, this is basically self-custody for securities. They got rid of this because they wanted to enforce a KYC AML regime so you would be able to track flows of capital, reasonable. But now you have public blockchains that do exactly that while retaining the self-custodial nature of these things. So you can reduce, you can move KYC AML checks to issuance and redemption and let the assets trade freely between them, right? All right, so, um, and then you have alternative assets. You know, these are, these form a massive part of people's portfolios. There's no way you're going to get uh, access to these assets on 
traditional capital markets, they're trying, but guess what? They're showing up on Solana before they're showing up on traditional capital markets. So well, it's gold, wine, whiskey, you know, sort of exotic real estate. That's all getting tokenized on Solana because the cost of tokenizing them is super low compared to, say, wrapping it into an ETF and launching it on, in the capital markets in the US. OK, so that's for investors, which means you should be able to open your phone, and every year you should have new assets you can buy that you want uh, you want to you want to access, and it's all powered by Solana in the back end. And then let's talk about issuers. If you're an entrepreneur and you want to take your company public, or you want to not take your company public, but at least allow for a healthy secondary market, how can you benefit from what Solana is building? Um, well, if you want to go public in the U.S. today, there's like basically it costs you anywhere between 10 to 20 million dollars, right? Which obviously sets a minimum valuation bar. Uh, which has to be high enough to warrant that kind of expenditure. And so the companies going public tend to be larger. The, the medium and small enterprises that could go public are not going public because they're not being serviced by the banking industry to do so. We think this is an opportunity for them to list directly on Solana. Um, you know, there's obviously the competition for exchanges in the US. You have something called Yall Street in Texas. You also have London Stock Exchange. So there are alternative venues to list. But these companies prefer not to list there because not, they're not as liquid. You, know, you don't have the rule of law guarantee that the US capital markets have. So um, we think that the internet succeeds the US capital markets, not any specific region. And that'll be the internet capital markets. Um, by the way, you can, which means, so founders here should be able to raise on the, like you should just be able to share a link on your X or LinkedIn if you're still on that, and then just start and just raise money from your professional network. This all, all of the regulatory infrastructure to do this exists today. It's just not used because it's cumbersome to implement. You know, uh, here's an example of previous experiments that have, you know, that have partially succeeded but eventually shut down because of COVID and other reasons. But this is kind of where we think the world is going. When you have a model that heavily incentivizes private equity groups to basically be building these cookie cutter development complexes, dropping in a Whole Foods, dropping in a papyrus store, you're creating an economic development on paper that doesn't actually feel like economic development when you're walking down the streets of these communities themselves. My name is Nick Matthews and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mainvest. Small businesses are the foundation of the American economy and access to capital is the number one challenge that small businesses across America face. Mainvest gives communities, not corporations, the ability to build the main streets they want to see. Mainvest isn't crowdfunding, Mainvest is investing. People are coming on not just to support local businesses, but also as a means of diversifying their portfolio into a new asset class. It was very difficult to get funding for a restaurant, and so this was a great starting point. That gives you a sense for, like, that was a company called Mainvest that was trying to get people to invest in main street businesses, right? Um, and we think that Solana is purpose-built to be able to handle this kind of load. The future is not just 2xing the IPOs. It's 10,000 xing the number of IPOs every year, which means in five years from now, if you walk into a coffee shop and you're like, this is an awesome coffee shop, I'd like to be a patron, you today you would leave a tip, right? That's how you would you acknowledge good service. In five years from now, there's going to be a QR code on the wall. You're going to scan that, and it's going to give you a few tokens that entitles you to ownership in the coffee shop, and they're streaming your dividends every... Uh, every month, right? So you're going to have, you know, 10x, the num not just 10x, but 10,000x the number of assets that you can access through a wallet interface as, you know, time rolls on. So it's not just, as you saw, you know, it's meme coins now, but every time there's a new season of coins, the, what that means is there's new assets coming on chain. All right, so what's the end state? I really like this tweet, uh, which kind of describes somewhat humorously the, the end state of what all this ends up looking like. It's like tech finance is embarrassingly vanilla. The greats of Wall Street were the true innovators. You know, Milken gave us junk bonds. Simmons gave us quantum and algo trading. And Silicon Valley gave us YC safe notes with a discount. Boring. Wake me up when I can buy defense junk tech uh, bonds, collateralized by annual securities, and then so on. You see like this complex sort of financialization that cannot exist on traditional markets because the cost of making them available are super high, but the cost of doing them on, on a blockchain interface is massively low. And so that leads to net new assets. And so we think that it is not just important, it's imperative as a society to create these investment opportunities or 
we've seen from you know millennia of research like uh, where you know researchers have concluded that if you don't if the wealth gap keeps increasing in society you sort of have these extremist politics you have you know sort of civil unrest and so it's it's going to be a policy mandate as we enter this next decade to make people in society owners of assets and we think Solana is going to play a critical role because it's the only te technology stack that is capable of doing this, along with, of course, our peers who are building, uh, you know, who are building competitive products on the uh, within the blockchain ecosystem. But I think the only internet-native finance layer today are blo public blockchains, and so we're very excited to be able to contribute to that. And uh, thank you very much for uh, having me today.